Hi everyone, this is Christopher Paolini again, and I am here with the awesome Fran Wild. Hi Fran. Hello. For those who don't know, you are the author of Updraft and the sequel, which I don't have here, of Cloudbound, correct? Yes. Now, now the third one is not out right yet, correct? Correct. I, um, it's finished. I am working on copy edits now. We have, um, I have the edit letter in hand and... Um, so things are moving along, and it will be out uh, in fall 2017. And do we have a title for book number three? Book number three is being called Horizon. Ooh, so Updraft, Cloudbound, and Horizon. I'm, I'm sensing a theme here. Would you care to expound on this theme? Um, well, the Updraft is, as you know, about a city of living bone that rises high above the clouds. The main character in Updraft uh, wants to be a trader that fly, who flies between um, the towers on man-made wings and brings things to different people and helps the city that way. It doesn't work out that way very well for her. Um, but in the, um, in the process of discovering more about herself and about the city, she changes the city um, in a monumental ways. And um, Cloudbound is about what happens after that what happens after a revolution and it's about where where updraft is about voice and about who gets to talk and who um, who a community listens to and not just about the main character's voice although there is that in there there are lots of other characters who for one reason or another um, are being ignored um, or who are who have much more influence over the community's value system um, specifically because of their voice Cloudbound is much more about leadership and about who should be leading and how you lead a group of um, towers that that might otherwise become individual city states of their own. Uh, the main character in that book um, is named Nat. He is one of Kirit's closest friends. Kirit is the main character from Updraft. Correct, correct. And Nat really wants to be a leader. Like really wants to be a leader. He has no idea how to do it, but he very much wants to be a leader. And Kirit is a leader, but she doesn't want to be one. So this story chronicles um, Nat's uh, realization of more about the city. Um, cloud To be cloud-bound in updraft means that you are thrown into the clouds by um, just by virtue of you've broken some laws. Um, the city... In order to appease the city, you are thrown into the clouds. And so cloudbound is a very vertical thing. Um, and the, the book is a lot about falling. And what is below the clouds? Well, that is, a, that is a thing that many people have asked me. And you get your answer in cloudbound at the very end. Ooh. Uh, so there are three books, but I didn't hold on to that question until the last book because I feel like the story isn't as – while, the, while the, one of the big questions is what's down there – um, it's also about what the community does with all of that once they discover mm -hmm. it. So Horizon is very much about um, community. So it's voice, leadership, and then community are the three big. So would you classify the books as fantasy or science fiction? It, it felt more like science fiction to me, but perhaps I'm wrong. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get this is a conversation that just came up. I was on um, Gary Wolf's Cood Street podcast last night, and he kept trying to get me to answer the same question. I have been um, in conversations where people say, you know, if fantasy is de defined by has magic, um, which sometimes it is, and science fiction is designed just defined by has technology. In that instance, there's no magic in my books. It's all engineering. But at the same time, I find engineering very magical. And I find things like man-made wings and bridges and um, overcoming great obstacles using technology as uh, to be an, a magical function in a lot of ways. There are also a lot of monsters in Updraft. Um, and you don't necessarily, although sometimes you do, you don't necessarily find monsters in science fiction. Um, but I, I like to play that middle ground in between the two. So the answer is yes. <laughs> well, you don't have wizards running around and um, casting fireballs, as far as I know. There are no wizards casting fireballs. There are no dragons. There are giant, invisible, flying carnivorous cephalopods, on the other hand. Yes, with tentacles, which I thought was quite appropriate and lots of fun to read about. 
Well, I think when you're when you're writing a flying culture, the philosophy of of a culture that is always going up and that is always thinking about dangers from every direction, if you have a monster that can appear out of absolutely nowhere, it's highly effective for and very disruptive at the same time. And I just thought the idea of, you know, being in a blue sky and just seeing a mouth open up in the sky is a really scary thing. It's kind of like swimming along in a pond and all of a sudden Jaws appears from nowhere. Yeah, yeah, that'd be rather terrifying. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh no, don't apologize. I mean, if it's effective, it's it's a useful technique. Uh, there's something very uh, H.P. Lovecraft about some of the um, some of those monsters I, that you you were using. I think I don't know if that was an, he was an inspiration for you or not really. And it's it's something that uh, has come up actually within two days. Uh, we were talking about especially young adult fiction um, has has science fiction and fantasy for young adults has emerged outside of the Lovecraft tradition in a way that I'm not sure that um, adult science fiction and fantasy has. My awareness of monsters is much more sourced from old um, sea tales and sea shanties and a lot of um, Greek myth, especially, but also myths and and legends and fables from other cultures uh, that I grew up reading. Um, I love the uh, like the Jabberwocky and different types of monsters from Alice in Wonderland, and those are sort of outside of the Lovecraftian culture. And I firmly believe that you can have tentacles and not have Lovecraft. Although you know there is definitely um, a massive influence and a massive sort of overwhelming fear of of the unknown in Lovecraft that definitely. Or two. Well, and to be fair, I think Lovecraft was drawing from some of those same traditions himself, uh, especially the fear of the sea and the unknown and all of that. Um, so now, what age range would you say your books are appropriate for? This is We were having this conversation before, and of course, the, the age range that the publisher says the book is for is not necessarily the age range that readers are actually going to you know, enjoy their books at? Because of the, the themes like the environmental and historical and economic themes that um, are in Updraft, Tor decided to publish it as an adult book, which is entirely appropriate. Kirit, the main character, is 17 when the story opens, and that puts her firmly in the YA category of age group. And her arc is a very YA arc. She is finding herself and where she fits in her community. But the arc of the, of the city is much more expansive. So what I have been finding, um, and it's not sort of up to me to determine how old somebody needs to be to read this book, but I have readers who are 11 and 12 and up who've read, you know, Hunger Games and some other books like that. Um, because I'm not very nice to my characters, but, um, that this is a totally legitimate book for them to read if, if they've, if they've gone that far, I have readers who are 16 and 17. I have a lot of readers in college and just post-college all the way up through people in their sixties and seventies and eighties. So it is a fairly broad range. Um, I'm discovering that a lot more ebook readers are younger um, like in, in college and that sort of thing. And then the, the very youngest and then the older ones who are, have, you know, homes that are more stable definitely are reading um, hardcover or paperback. And now that the paperback, now that the paperback has, is out, it's going to be very interesting to see the demographics on that. Because I think that, you know, the, the being able to purchase paperback um, and to give um, as gifts, maybe the hardback or, or, or cloudbound and updraft together, which I've seen happening a lot, um, May change the dynamic. Did you have an audience or a specific, specific age range for your readership in mind when you wrote Updraft, or was it ultimately you were just trying to write the best book you could and sort of let the cards fall where they fall? I was trying to tell a good story. Uh, I was trying to tell a story about friendship and about families um, and and about um, a very strange uh, city that had flying as its main mode, main mode of transport, because I was very interested in um, how that would change people's attitudes towards how they moved around. Walking is, is not as, you know, you don't walk between towers unless you cross a bridge, but you definitely, um, you fly a lot more in this culture. And I was, I was looking at, um, because they are motivated to constantly move up in the world, um, that, was, that was a social and socioeconomic um, discussion that I was having at the time um, because the towers grow up and then the central core of each tower grows out. And so people are sort of pushed up 
and you can't carry very much up with you, so you lose things on the way up. Um, and that's that was fascinating to me. So I was just trying to tell the best story I could around that kind of culture and that kind of world. Because I mean, world building is is genuinely something that I love to do. Um, as much as building monsters and to tell the best story within that world without declaring this is going to be one kind of story or another. That sort of let it evolve naturally. Now, how do you go about your world building? Because I personally, you know, I read, I've, I've read Updraft. I haven't read Cloudbound yet. And I thought you had a very interesting society and some of the technology as well, like the wings and the bone technology and stuff that people develop, which they would, of course. Um, but how did all of that, how did that process work for you? I started with a small short story and then another short story. And then I, st I had, between the two, I had a basic setting and I had some polit political questions. So the first short story was written as a response to a writing challenge uh, where I was given a mechanical toy and told to write a short story for a fictional meta um, mega cities anthology run um, by, among other people, um, someone who was associated, associated with the Lutheran community. And I thought that was really interesting, but I didn't want to write a megacity story that was, you know, um, like skyscrapers and things. I love um, K.W. Jeter's Farewell Horizontal, which is a great, great book about megacities. And Stephen Gould's short story, um, Peaches for Mad Molly, which is, again, a skyscraper megacity story. Um, but I also love the tr the the biggest mega city of them all, which is Milton's Pandemonium uh, in Paradise Lost, and this the rising up of that. And I wanted to sort of make an organic city, and Living Bones seemed to be a very um, a, ver a very organic way to organize a city. Um, there are certain things that you can do with bone that you can't necessarily do with something that's not growing. So it literally grew the city. Um, the second story that I, and that, and that very first story, I had um, the flying and the man-made wings and the bridges and the city was already sort of roaring and talking and nobody really, you know, people were trying to interpret what it meant. And the wind was absolutely there from the beginning. But the second story I wrote, because I thought it was just going to be a series of short stories. I wasn't going anywhere near a novel. I just finished one. I wanted to take a break. Um, we That novel's still in the drawer. But the, it was my first novel. This is my second novel that I'd ever written. Uh, and so I wrote a short story about a winged knife fight in a wind tunnel, which was this one tower had grown slightly differently than all the others. And it created a, a central core that you could fly fights in. And I had two characters fighting for the right to speak in this wind tunnel. And that occasioned the whole political system that went with, you know, a, a culture that was focused on rising. Um, po politically speaking, if you have a society that expects its, its people to fight in order to be able to speak their minds or have a question answered, you've got a very interesting set of rules already. And I want to explore that. So do you find that by actually like writing these short stories, it allows you to develop ideas and create ideas easier than if you're simply sitting with a blank piece of paper and saying, okay, so I've got these bone towers and what's going to happen in them and how they, so it sort of puts you in the location versus sort of doing it in a more abstract fashion. Definitely. And along the way, I take notes. Um, I figure out, you know, I'm operating at altitude, so I need high altitude foods. I need high altitude, um, and, you know, the bees, um, figuring out how high the bees can be raised in the Himalayas, for instance, gave me some clues as to how much I could work with um, higher. All the food in updraft is high altitude food the, the, and things that are sort of um, earth adjacent if they're not actually, you know, earth secondary world has that sort of stretchability to it. And I didn't want to go creating names for everything. Although some things, the birds, for instance, have their own types of names um, that are sort of linguistically related to the, the um, animals that we're familiar with, like the corvids and the cavex or that sort of thing. Um, so I do take notes um, and I take notes related to the short stories, but writing short stories lets me work out how people live within the world as I'm building it, which I want to do. How long do your short stories tend to be? Because, uh, you know, it's a time commitment to write a short story that's not time spent working on the main novel. And so, you know, how long do those short stories tend to be for you? How short are they? And how long does it take you to actually write them? And are you able to use them elsewhere? 
Yes. Um, yes to all of those questions. The short stories are between 3,000 and 5,000 words. I usually write about 2,500 words a day. So um, especially when I know where I'm going. Um, when I'm writing exploratory drafts, uh, it depends. But um, I am absolutely able to use them elsewhere. If I'm writing different characters, if I want to explore a different character, um, I usually publish those as, sh as standalone short stories. So there is one in Beneath Ceaseless Skies called Bent the Wing, Dark the Cloud, which is all about wing makers. And there is another in Lightspeed this, this month, which is a reprint called A Moment of Gravity Circumscribed, which is about a much younger um, character that people will become familiar with in Cloudbound. So I do use those. Um, the original story, the knife fight in the wind tunnel between two characters fighting for the right to speak is right in the middle of updraft. And did you have to rework it much in order to make it fit into the rest of the story? No, I actually, um, I did rework it a bit and it definitely got um, edited quite a bit, but it was, um, it, it is there almost as I wrote it. And what was great about that was that um, a lot of the questions that came out of that, what kind of society would do this, and who are these characters, and why would they be fighting each other, really helped shape the book. Um, but the book didn't start until I heard Curate fighting with her mother and bargaining with her mother, because bargaining and trading is such a big part of their relationship. So now I'm guessing that you are, based off everything you're saying, that you're more of a uh, do it by the seat of your pants plotter than someone who outlines everything before you sit down to write. I am a pantser by nature. I am a terrible, terrible baker in the kitchen. I can't stand baking because it's too much measurement and too many, you know, organized steps. I love taking whatever's in the fridge and, and putting together a really, really great meal. Um, I am learning, though, that along the way, if I stop and, and outline a bit, that it helps me write faster. So um, I do a bit of both. I'm a little bit of a hybrid, but pantsing first, then plotting later. How about you? I, I've done both, and I found that I absolutely have to outline because given the size of my novels, if I go off the tracks on page 200 and then proceed to write another 400 pages, um, the, you know, having to go back and fix that or wrench things back in a better direction is, is such a massive undertaking that it's not something I really am excited or eager to do uh so just for as you said say making just to write faster having us having an outline is easier and especially when there are uh invented technologies and rules of magic and whatever else is going on being very clear on what's possible and what isn't possible is important for me and it just takes a lot of thought that's cool well, yeah, and that's actually sometimes more fun than the actual writing because you're not bound by having to make it presentable. So you can just go around saying, oh, and this is possible, and which means that, we would, that this would be possible, and it leads to this implication, and, uh, and that's so much fun just spitballing those ideas. But then you have to actually sit down and write it and tell the, tell the story. So Updraft is your first published novel. Yes. And as you mentioned, you write lots of, or you were writing a lot of short stories prior to that, and poetry as well, I believe. So what was the transition like going from that to an actual full-length novel? Because, I mean, Updraft is, let me, let me see here, 380-some uh, pages long. So, I mean, that's, that's a big difference from a three 5,000-word long story. It is. Um, my shortest story that I published last year was 250-word retelling yeah. of Orpheus and Eurydice <laughs> um, in ter by GPS directions. So there's, there's a point in the middle of the story where it goes recalculating because something happened. Um, and that joke only works once, but it was really fun to do, to, to write that short. I, um, I love writing long. I love creating a world that I can really stretch out in, but um, where I think I have to work is writing those long descriptive sentences about the way things work. On the other hand, um, one, of, one of the first stick sentences, sort of what you talk about when you talk about the er sentence of a book, um, is, is a much more poetic, but also a very sort of descriptive um, sentence for the, for the book. And it's the, um, on a morning like this, fear is a blue sky emptied of birds. And that, is, that was one of the first sentences that sort of came at me from 
the beginning of updraft. And that's a lovely sentence. And do you use a lot of poetic techniques then in your prose, or do you try to keep them separate? I suspect they fall in there by accident quite a bit. Um, I, I cannot um, deny the fact that I get caught up in the sound of my own words. And there are times when I am reading aloud or when I'm going to readings where I have, am just sort of, you know, boxing my own ears because I wrote myself a tongue twister that looks really good on the page. But when you actually have to say it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I also write songs within the book. There is a lot of singing. There are a lot of old traditional songs that come through that, that um, help build the world in the first book. In the second book, my characters are actually adjusting those songs and, and playing with them and trying to change them. And then in Horizon, there are new songs. So it, I do um, use the poetic techniques that I have learned and, and been using for years um, in that way as well. And that um, helps with structure. I love, I love structural poems. I am, um, I'm still sometimes write Sestinas and, and Villanelles, but uh, mostly those are for private or they're for friends. Um, occasionally I'll write a revenge Sestina, which when I'm some, when I'm mad at somebody, I'll go write in a poem. So. so does having, does having that technical background, because I, I think a lot of people nowadays don't get trained in the technical aspects of poetry. You know, if you take a class in poetry in high school or even in college, sometimes a lot of times it can be sort of like, well, you know, go write whatever you want in whatever style you want. And we're not going to rhyme. We're not going to have any sort of definitive, you know, noticeable rhythm and, uh, and people so just just go off writing this unstructured blank verse. Um, it's not even blank verse. Uh, and that can certainly be an acceptable form of poetry, but they don't have the technical chops underneath it, I think. I think learning techniques um, uh, uh, in anything, learning a craft in anything is really excellent. Um, it's, it's Ezra Pound once said that um, all art requires structure and a variant. And you sort of, and the, the translation of that is that you need friction to make a spark. And so structure often exists as a way to create friction for creative ideas. And that, that constraint um, sometimes makes the, those ideas just so much clearer and stronger and more wonderful. So I'd say yes, but I also say that um, being able to read across um, communities and read read widely to see what people are using, um, I got fascinated with the um, northern Indian uh, form of the guzzel, which is a, a, a really intense structure. Um, and just looking at how that was done, and it was such a huge step away from the structures that I had learned as a poet. But I also love free verse, and I love I love poems that just turn and turn in on themselves until you just they just explode. Um, I'm trying to think of a good one, and all I'm coming up with is this is a Sestina, which is actually I'm coming up with a Villanelle too, which is Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, um, which is one that just you know starts off very normally, and the art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem in, seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. And by the end of the poem, she's lost absolutely everything, and everything has gone to you know just c completely down the drain. And I like those too. I like when when poetry and fiction moves within a structure that you've built for it. I love how you phrased that. <laughs> I really do. That, that's a, you know, and I agree. And it's, it, it, poetry in some ways is the purest form of writing because it's distilled to its essence, mm -hmm. but it's also incredibly difficult to write as it should be because it is that concentrated essence of language and can also be equally difficult to read, but equally rewarding, I think. Yes. Yeah, I agree. De depending on the poem, and I, and I should warn anyone who perhaps isn't familiar with poetry that just because a poem is difficult to read does not mean it is a good poem. No, no, absolutely not. And sometimes poems are better when they are read aloud than they are on the page. Sometimes they, they are completely different objects um, in that case. But yeah, no, the difficulty and impenetrability of poetry has, has a long history, especially in academics. And some poems are, are wonderful that you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't consider poems at all. There's a, um, Muhammad Ali wrote one of the shortest poems ever in existence, which is Me, We. And that is just, it's such a, you know, it, it's such a, um, it, it, it can be compared to Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. This might seem like an odd question, but do you have any musical training or musical background? 
I do. Because it seems like a lot of writers who like poetry and like the music of the language tend to have some sort of musical background. Yeah, I sang in a lot of choirs. I sang in, you know, my district choir and um, I played a couple of musical instruments as a kid. Um, I love, I still sing in the car. Um, I was in seventh or eighth grade. I was in a, a group that sang all of Carmina Burana with some trained, um, opera singers, which was great, except for several of us had been studying Latin for several years. So we knew exactly what we were singing, um, which wasn't so great. I always like the swan complaining about being roasted black. That was just, right? every time I hear that, I burst out laughing, but that's yep. me. Yeah, I just I I love Orf. I love I love the the classics, and um, it is it it's kind of funny because when I go sit down to write, one of the things that I do, I'm also um, a programmer. I do a little bit of computer programming, and when I go to sit down and program, I will put one song on and just put it on repeat for the entire duration of the project. And that is a, is a good way for me to get mentally ready to work and not get focused on, um, the words of the song or whatever I'm listening to. Sometimes it's a whole album, especially if it's classical and I'm not, um, listening to the words, but often it is a one word song that I put on for the duration of the project and then I can never listen to again. And, um, so Updraft and Cloudbound and actually Horizon were all written um, that way. A little bit of Updraft was written to classical music, which is perfectly appropriate, um, including Carmina Verana and, um, the Magnificat, which is a Bach piece. Um, but I, I love all sorts of music and I love um, the act of singing. The one thing you will never see me do at a reading is sing the songs in Updraft and Cloudbound because singing in public is terrifying to me. Uh, I could sing karaoke just fine, but I can't, I can't do the performance piece anymore that I had no problem doing when I was a kid. That's reading. interesting. Yeah. Do you sing? Um, yes, but I have no training and I'm told that, um, well, especially by my sister, I'm told that, you know, when I start singing that, uh, everyone just sort of cringes and runs away. So, but I love music. I love music. Sisters are kind of cruel that way though. <laughs> uh, but they're honest. The, the most honest critics you're going to have. Well, given that, so, so talk about the performance aspect for a second, because, um, you know, being a published author really is, really does involve two separate aspects to your career. I mean, on one, one hand, you spend a lot of time sitting alone in a room tapping on a keyboard or writing on a piece of paper. And on the other hand, you have to go out and stand up in front of a whole bunch of different people. And that's a completely different skill to do that, stand up and perform and do a reading and talk about your work. So how is that for you? Do you enjoy it? I enjoy it very much. I love getting up and reading. I love talking to people. Um, I, I adore going to bookstores and book events and meeting with people. And I especially like going into classrooms. Um, and part of that is because I was a teacher. And it, part of that is just I'm a natural born clown. And I like interacting with, um, with different communities. I like meeting my readers. Then I have to go hide and recharge because it really is, I am, I am a very extroverted introvert and I like to sort of hole up and, you know, just occasionally talk to people by text and then I'll realize that I haven't used my voice in a while. Um, the thing about being trained as a, as a poet and as a singer is they will train you to stand and uh, recite poetry. Uh, if, it depends on where you are, but quite often this happens, where um, you will deliver a poem um, standing and you will learn how to not only project your voice, but use um, a little bit of body motion to capture people's, re uh, cap capture people's attention. Um, so I do that in reading still. I will, I will go out in front of the table. I will get up from the chair mm -hmm. and I will move myself in front because it's a lot easier to connect if you don't have a piece of huge furniture in front of you. Um, it's, and you can move, you can move. The one thing that you lose the power of is there's, you have to hold your book up. And if you're reading a really long passage, that can get a little painful, but, um, it's worth it. And it's worth being able to really see, um, the audience's reaction and to kind of feel the audience's reaction as well. Um, I learned from, um, one really great reader that if you tilt your head to one side for one character's voice and then you move a little bit to the other side for another character's mm. voice, that helps indicate the change in a way that just reading it straight won't do. Well, and I can tell you from experience that once you do the readings enough, uh, you'll just end up memorizing them by accident, even if it's a couple of pages and you can just dispense with the book entirely. But I usually like the book because it makes a good prop 
<laughs> yes. Well, and then any pictures have you holding the book, which is also really good because the social media aspect of, of doing a public performance. Exactly. Exactly. Is really helpful. Let's talk about classical literature a little bit. I mean, you seem widely read, and how has that influenced your writing and your interest in writing? And I'm widely read in Western literature. I am not as widely read in um, East Eastern literature or um, in. I, I I do a lot of um, reading in Russian literature and in um, Eastern European literature, especially. And I'm starting to try and read widely um, in Chinese literature, not not in the original, but in translation. Um, so I love, um, uh, like in, from the Soviet era, I love, um, Bulgakov who wrote, uh, Heart of a Dog and Master and Margarita, which are the, the magical texts of, of Russia. Um, I, James Joyce out of Ireland, um, Milton, as we talked about, I like a lot of the poets from those areas as well. And, um, the, the, uh, from India and from Pakistan and from, from Southeast Asia. There are so many excellent writers that I'm discovering currently, like Arundhati Roy and, um, oh, I'm trying to remember who wrote A Fine Balance. Um, it's just, there is such a richness out there in classical literature, as well as in nonfiction, that I find that I'm reading all the time, um, not just in fantasy, but in, in, um, and in science fiction, but in nonfiction and in, in traditional literature as well. And that's just great. I mean, that is hugely helpful to my own writing. How about you? Do you find that as well? I, I do. I'll do. Although, although I have a perhaps slightly odd question for you, which is, what do you get out of the reading? And the, reason, and the reason I ask this is because I've noticed in different stages of my life, as I've gotten older, I get different things out of books. You know, when I was a very young child, it was just, it was exciting to read and the stories were exciting. When I was a teenager, there were all of these coming of age stories, especially in fantasy, that appealed to me because, of course, that's what I was experiencing at the time and it, uh, I related to it. And then as I grew out of that, there were things I, that appealed to me in stories that I didn't understand when I was younger. And that process continues. So I'm kind of curious, what, what do you get out of the reading and what appeals to you? Um, I, I think, and that relates back to Updraft a little bit, I, I read in layers. So I read for adventure still. I am, I, you know, if you give me a good sailing adventure, a good, you know, Patrick O'Brien or something, I am all in for it. But um, I also really enjoy like reading for language and structure and philosophy. And that can be found in almost any genre, in any medium. Um, the, the author's philosophy is something that I kind of look for, but also the world philosophy and the worldview. Um, in certain cases, I get a particular ten attendance to language um, or to dialogue now. And, and so that's a craft layer that I think is, is something that I really enjoy, um, just studying how other people do things. But um, for the most part, what I like finding within anything that I'm reading is hope. So I always look for that sense of, you know, even though the world is going to, you know, complete and utter destruction or something's happening or there's a giant monster attacking, there's always some sort of sense that there is hope in those books. And that I tend to read for that. I think that's a wonderful point. And it's actually worth mentioning that um, Updraft, for example, does end with a note of hope and has a sense of hope throughout it. Um, personally, yeah, if a book is just completely depressing from start to finish, I, there, there has to be a very compelling reason for me to read it. Yes. And I mean, Cloudbound's a little sad. Cloudbound's got some tough things to it, but there's still hope. There's yeah. just, it's, you know, rapidly fading in the distance, but it's still there. <laughs> um, it, it is, uh, and the, the hope comes from, as, as with all of our hope, it comes from each other. It comes from connections that you forge between, between people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important. So what is the one thing you find yourself continually returning to in your writing? I ask every author this because I always get a different answer. But is there a, a scene, a feeling, an element, a character? I mean, what's the one thing that always draws you to stories in your own writing? I think that what draws me to stories um, is especially... Um, that idea of, of connections between people. Mm. Uh, so it really, it, in, in any culture, in any um, aspect of, of the stories I'm writing, for instance, I wrote a story for Asimov's a couple years ago that was about military optics and the ghost of Tallulah Bankhead. 
And um, just the idea that a, a person, a young person who was an embedded journalist and who had experienced some terrible things during a, a war um, and was suffering from PTSD could connect with a ghost whose only interest in life was to get out into um, the major mainframe database system and, and set herself free. So just that connection between two random things is, is something that comes back a lot. I write a lot about technology and its interaction with society. Mm -hmm. I write a, a lot about um, handcrafted art. Um, I write about jewelers and I write about artifacts as engineers, um, scientists quite a bit, um, but mostly the hand, the handcraft arts. Um, so I, I've, I have a whole series on um, some very bad gems that starts off with the novella that came out this year also called The Jewel in Her Lapidary. And has, um, that, that's been interesting too. But mostly um, you'll see a lot of birds in my books. You'll see a lot of different themes and you'll see a lot of monsters too. Um, and occasionally you will see a verse or two of poetry, um, and you'll see myth and legend coming back around, kind of like with the um, Orpheus and Eurydice hmm. uh, story that I mentioned earlier. Interesting answer, not one I've gotten before. It's probably a longer answer that you've <laughs> No, I, I, I wouldn't say that. It's, it's, but everyone has their own obsessions, and uh, I think that those are often what lead to the, the core of what makes their work a person's work good because if if an author doesn't actually care about something then how can they write about anything with passion or in or even intelligence sometimes sure sure absolutely so if you were to give any advice to an up and coming writer someone who's just starting out um what what are some things that you wish you knew starting out finish your stories finish what you start don't drop it because it's bad in the middle and then start something new, finish the story, start to finish, and then go back and revise because nothing is, is worthless and nothing is lost. Um, you may not use the final draft, but you will have finished the story and you won't feel like you're a failure. Um, also, don't be afraid to be weird. Yeah, no, normal is boring. Normal is boring and normal is familiar. Um, and sometimes we write to the familiar, but we bring our own take to it and then we feel like, no, that's too weird. And I don't think that's true. That's some advice I wish I'd had when I was starting out. Me too. <laughs> exactly. Because I was writing these really twee little poems and I look back on them like, oh, Lord, child, you knew so much more than that. Well, and, and you can't let yourself be limited by fear of what other people might say when, when they read your work. Um, I mean, in my case, of course, you know, my family was going to read my work first. And so it's always a little um, scary to be honest in the writing when you know your parents and your you know siblings are going to be your first readers but um, you you can't let that something like that limit you or you're not going to do justice to the story that's entirely true as well and also read widely i mean that is that is a big thing to read read not just what you like but read the things that those that influence those people or that those you know if you if you read chris and and you read aragon then definitely read updraft cuz you know that helps well, I enjoyed reading Updraft. I recommend it to people. Thank I think you. everyone should check this out. And um, I look forward to reading your future books because I can, I can also see how you're developing your skills and you're continuing to read. And I think that's always an awesome thing. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, well, and, and also my pleasure to have you here talking with me today. Uh, is there anything else you would like to say to our viewers that we haven't covered already? No, it's very nice to meet you all. And, um, you know, don't be afraid to stop by my website or uh, find me on Twitter or anywhere else on social media because I'm out there. So for Montana, this is Christopher Paolini signing out. Thank you again, everyone. And uh, we'll do this again soon. Bye.